Hey. Okay, well, maybe we'll just start and then people can jump in if they arrive. If not, the, the video has been recorded so they can catch up afterwards. Um, yeah. Yeah, so she'll ask me to step in and um, organize this meeting. So as I understand it from her, this is kind of to look at the overall plan or structure for the FPJ development. Um, so yeah, I've seen the chat from Aaron about the open CPI, which looks very interesting. Um, I watched a presentation about it today, but I was hoping you might be able to give us a bit of an introduction to what it is and how it works. Sure. Uh, so open CPI uh, is a, a framework and it stands for component portability infrastructure. Um, and it tries to uh, deal with both uh, to, um, both the general purpose processor and an FPGA uh, or any processing element. Um, so we've in the past have considered, you know, also including GPUs and we worked with OpenCL for a little bit, um, but it's not, it's, it's not um, a feature yet, but it's still under consideration. And, and what it is, is it's similar to GNU radio uh, in that you break down uh, components um, based by, um, by functionality, but instead of in GNU radio, uh, the, the, you know, you're, you're targeting the, the processor uh, and it doesn't go any, doesn't go anywhere else. Um, so what we, we try to do with our components, um, it, it, you can target them for the FPGA and or the general purpose processor. Um, and one of the features of OpenCPI is a platform portability. So once a platform is considered uh, OpenCPI compliant, an application and components that were developed um, can, be, can be run on that platform, executed on that platform. Another thing that uh, comes along with uh, the framework is, is the, um, it's platform agnostic. So we don't, we don't, we have our own DMA engine um, we don't use, you know, IIO from analog or um, Epic has their own DMA or Edis with UHD. Um, we have our own. Um, and that, you know, allows us to get data on from the FPJ to, to the ARM on, on a Zinc or even uh, across that to a development host uh, that's also connected to the system. Uh, on the fabric, we have what is called a uh, scale scalable data plane. So we have, it's similar to Axie, but it's not it's not 100% Axie, to allow our components to talk to each other. Um, and you, once you string components together, uh, you create an application and you can run the application. Um, another uh, advantage of OpenCPI is that we have a remote execution model. There's different ways to deploy applications. Um, there's a standalone deployment where Everything's running on, on the platform itself. There's a uh, network mode execution where um, the, on the ARM you um, mount NFS storage and that allows you to access all of the artifacts, all the components available for that platform and run. And then we has, also have remote, remote mode, which allows you from a development host to essentially run applications on the, on the device, um, um, but you're executing that from from the host itself, um, so it's kind of it's not it's not partial reconfiguration that we do on the on the uh, on the FPGA fabric, but it's close, where we're always um, you know stripping away the the bitstream and loading a new one based on the application um, specifications. Um, and then another thing that OpenCPI brings to the table is you know applic an application control interface which allows you to manipulate registers from the software side, from the host or from the ARM um, on, the, on the FPGA itself. And, and there's a lot of different, different details. And I know some of you guys have been started going down that pathway um, and there is a slight learning curve, but um, that's why I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, I, one of the, it's always been a, a pain getting new users, not, a, not necessarily a pain, but it's difficult to get new users because, uh, you know, I've been working with OpenCPI for two years, but the, the OpenCPI has, has existed for, I think, over dec uh, at least a decade, if not two. So there's a lot, there's a lot to learn. Okay, nice. It sounds very impressive. Um, I was curious, how does it 
So when you're interacting with OpenCAPI, you go straight from OpenCPI to a Bitstream or you go to some um, intermediate RTL and then you put that into Vivado. Oh yeah, so we handle, because of our platform, ag it, it, vendor agnostic and platform agnostic. So um, we, we have a lot of examples with Xilinx, but it's not limited to using Xilinx FPGAs. Um, so we kind of handle that those tools together because we have uh, we use incremental compilation, where you had your component uh, will generate a net list, and then once you have you know uh, what we call an assembly is 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 a bunch of components on the FPG that are running together, um, and that'll generate um, the bitstream itself um, that has also also all that other. Uh, you know, data flowing DMA engine uh, along in it in, in the bitstream itself. But as f so, the, the workflow is a little bit different. It's not you're not using Vivado directly. We call Vivado in the background, and it, a lot of it is in, in command line. Mm -hmm. um, and the loading of the bitstream, we, there's a kernel module, an Open CPI kernel module that uses the um, FPGA manager, uh, depending on what uh, version of Linux you're running on the embedded system. Um, cause you know, long, long ago we were using dev CFG, uh, dev config, um, um, and, but in recent kernels, we, we've been leveraging the FPGA manager to uh, load and unload the bitstream. Okay. Nice. Um, yeah, I mean, to me, it sounds quite interesting because personally I've tried to get the whole, um, interface to the ADI transceivers and that was a pain and if stuff like this makes things like that more more simple or more portable i think that's yeah. that's good so um, we do have direct support for the uh, analog devices 809361 and i know i've been following you guys for a while you, you guys are targeting the 809371 and support with an open cpi for that um is slated for sometime at the end of this year um and the, that will handle the the transceiver itself, and then it'll pipe the you know the ADC and the DAC uh, into OpenCPI so that it can be consumed by by the components. Okay, that's interesting. So maybe maybe we should even consider targeting the ninety three six sorry sorry ninety six. So I get uh, 80, 90, 360 one. Yeah, the sixty one. Yep. <laughs> so consider so one of our one of our supported platforms is the Pluto SDR, mm -hmm. and and that has a zinc on it, and the eighty ninety three sixty three, which is similar to the ninety three sixty one. Um, so if you want to get something quickly and expensively and into users' hands, so that that's a potential platform that's supported. Yeah, that might be an option. Um, if we can, because all the great work by Andre and Anshul on the. Decode, um, the transmit um, encoding modulation is kind of not being utilized from over over the air yet, even though it's been quite mature for a while. So it'd be good if we can get to the point of testing it over the air as soon as possible. Um, maybe this is a good good way of doing that. Yeah. So I, I've been looking over the the Andre's work, and uh, it's very extensive and very impressive. Um, and looking at what's the the quickest way we can get to something demonstrable. Um, and originally, I, I before I had taken a look at it, I was looking at it. You know, we can break it apart and we can we can test each component. But he's already even he has unit tests for that already. Um, so uh, so currently, what I'm I'm looking into is is just taking that IP block he has. Um, it's configurable over Axe Four Lite, and then consuming that in in Open CPI as as one one component altogether. And then trying to hook it up to the transceiver, um, mm. and, and that's the approach that I think uh, would get us something something quicker. Okay, yeah, that sounds good. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah um, uh, if, I, I don't know if it helps, but uh, but I, I oh never mind. So I was gonna say that it might be not needed at all, like to configure actually, but uh, it actually is so. Never mind. Like you okay, need to write so, so, some Yeah, so just just you know, uh, set all the all the registers, you know, with a base configuration, and then uh, go go it from from there. Is that what you're suggesting? Say that again. Just just you know, using it as the the default configuration. 
Uh, yeah, um, but uh, like there, you, you need uh, you still need to write the coefficients for the oh the filters, the filters, and, yeah, and the modulation table because uh, basically the way if I if I was to support every configuration, like the modulation table would be huge. Mm -hmm. So I sort of limited to say there's one table for. QPSK 8, 16, and 32. Um, but within, I, think, I don't remember, to be honest, I think within the 32 one, depending on some other parameter, it can be a different table. Mm -hmm. um, anyways, there's a table and the coefficients. So, uh, but, I, but I have the, um, oh, so if you look you, at the scene, was, you have the values. So. I was looking for, like I, I noticed that you're using peek and poke so that you can you know write the values in the register table but i didn't find you have like a script or something that writes those values yeah, on, i do on I, initialization. I, I, I do uh, locally uh, it's not uh, published or pub you know anywhere uh, it's very you know, um, sort of very ugly very hacked together i, okay. I can send you um, yeah, there, there's like a, a method that gets the let's say modulation and it generates the writes for the tables. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can, uh, the way I try to do is keep the write um, say uh, separated from the actual, uh, how do you say this? Like there is a class that has the values mm -hmm. and you pass the write and read function to that. So if you're writing, I don't know, using peek, peek and poke or using file descriptors or using, I don't know, ethernet, whatever. Yeah. It just, yeah. It, it, it calls a function with address and data yeah. as parameters and you do whatever. Okay. Yeah, I can send you, I, I'm not home at home right now, but I can send you, um, yeah, in half an hour or so. Okay, that sounds good. That'd be helpful, thank you. From what I'm reading, you have, workers right so for example if you have you can implement certain function with with a worker uh, and to run like you have to have that resource or that platform for example the fpj i think is the most obvious like if you don't have a supported platform platform then you not be able to use that worker right um so we try to build workers that that are applicable on pretty much, so generic enough where it can work on any platform that we support, but there will be some instances where obviously you don't have access to the, you know, some of the primitives on certain FPGA architectures. Um, so a lot of our components that currently exist, try to, try, to, try to build some stuff from scratch so that it can be inferred. But there are, there are times where we wanna leverage, you know, the vendor, you know, IP cores that are available you know, for building furs or whatnot. Um, but so, yeah, there is the mechanism where you can have uh, you know, shadowing implementations of workers that work for specific FPGA architectures. Uh, um, but I, I don't know if that answers your question or not. <laughs> yeah, uh, what I was, maybe I, 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 I'm terrible at explaining stuff. So okay. <laughs> what I was, <laughs> So I, I was trying to get the DMA going, right? So yeah. I had to do the, the like the Pella Linux and a lot of the stuff. And I was, anyways. So I, I know I, I know that some pro, like some processors will have uh, like um, I mean like an emulator, I think QM, QMU or something. Yeah, QMU, yeah. So uh, I mean, you, you could in theory run the whole thing simulated or emulated, right? Is it yeah. something? So we, we haven't uh, gone down that path. I mean, it's been on my mind for a little mm -hmm. bit, being able to simulate, you know, the whole thing using QMU or however it's pronounced. Um, but as far as the DMA um, on a zinc, um, the way it works is we've separated. I think we, we talked a little about this in Slack, mm -hmm. where there's a, a control plane and a data plane. Um, and so the, the control allows you to, you know, set and get, you know, properties of the, of the workers that are on the FPGA fabric. There's also some metadata, so you can, you can read back, you know, bitstream, what version of the, there's a UID in the bitstream. So, you know, what bitstream you, you have loaded on the FPGA, 
Um, and that that is uses uh, one of the Axie general purpose ports on between the fabric and the ARM processor and the zinc. And then for the data plane, we use uh, uh, the high performance ports and, and we have a translation from Axie to to our on chip um, communication, uh, the scalable data plane, and then does that conversion for you. Um, and then once we have um, so you have a worker working on HDL. Um, typically, there's a uh, also a worker on the general purpose processor that's consuming that data via that interconnect, um, and then you you can do whatever you need to. Um, so mm -hmm. in the past, when I've generated waveforms using OpenCPI, we we usually hook it up to to like uh, libzmq. Uh, and then pass that data on to something that you know cares about it. Um, so there, there's different ways to to do things once you have that data, that data path on on the general purpose processor. And then sometime, mm -hmm. and then also within OpenCPI, you can you can run your application uh, away from the platform too. So you can you also because it, it supports distributed environment, so you're not tied to necessarily just one device. You can. You also can run things on the, you know, if you have a laptop nearby that has an x86-64 or, and then you can also have workers across different FPGAs. Um, so yeah, there's a, there's a lot of options. Um, mm -hmm. So um, I guess generating the DVBS to frames, right? When we get to that point, where would that be coming from? Would that be from GNU radio? Yeah. Uh, the input data? Yeah, the input data. Mm. I think that would be coming from Unchill's um, GSE encoder, wouldn't it? Oh, encoder. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so right now, uh, the way I've been testing is I have like carefully crafted data. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like the, the length has to be very specific. Um, so with the uh, GSC encoder, it will uh, sort of uh, package multiple uh, like Ethernet frames and mm -hmm. sort of take care of. You. So you just basically send uh, blocks of data, and it will sort of create the the basic frames to feed the thing. Mm -hmm. uh, so to answer your question, it can be random data, but it has to be it has to have a certain length, and that that's right now the only limitation okay so the obviously uh, if you're checking then um, you have so the way i've been checking i, I run GNU radio with random um, data going in and i sort of tap stuff around mm -hmm. and i use the the outputs to check against okay um, yeah, I, yeah it's not to the point where i can just generate random data and yeah, you know, immediately gets what the expected data looks like. Yeah, so, so we have several. I mean, you know, workers that that you run on the mm -hmm. we call it RCC platform, and that stands for Resource Constrained C. So it, it's just a term that OpenCPI came up with, um, but essentially just mm -hmm. running on the ARM, or it, yeah, it, you know, just read a file and then write a file, and then we can we can check the check check to see. And, um, whether that the, the data that is being generated or is valid, depending on what what you have instantiate like workers you have um, that you want to test. Uh, so there is there's even a, a unit test framework um, that kind of handles that for you, um, and you can test e either properties or parameters. And a parameter is you know build build time configuration, and a property is something that can be configurable during runtime. Um, and there's a there's a unit test framework that that allows you to uh, to to test components on the FPGA um, on a unit basis, and and that's kind of where I originally started. But just to get something quicker uh, working, because you know how I mentioned that I wanted to to decompose your encoder into its and into its parts, but you've already done that already, so I'm not sure if that's beneficial. Um, I, it depends on use cases. Like if if it helps, maybe you have something else that might use. I don't know, just the I don't know, BCH or whatever. Mm. You know, 
for, like for this project, I think the whole thing as a as as one is sort of the what we're going after. So, but in the future, is we can break up. It's it's all right. Yeah. So it's one thing I was curious about from the presentation I watched, which was the um, GNU radio conference from last year, I think. Mm -hmm. for, I understand it correctly that you could basically have different implementations for each block. So one thing I've wanted to do for a long time is to have a, an end-to-end -end simulation. So we could have basically Python high-level models for bits we haven't made yet. And then later we can fill them in with the real RTL. Is that correct? Yeah, so we, we call, we, well, when we create components, uh, we encourage, um, you know, component developers to generate both, you know. So unfortunately, right now, we don't support Python directly as, as a worker for, for um, the general purpose processor. We support C and C++. Um, but yeah, we call those workalikes. So, so, so a component is, is basically just a specification. You know, just defining the ins and outs and the types of configuration you might do, and then a worker is the the implementation of that component, and that that implementation can be either for the FPGA or for for the, the general purpose processor. And then when you generate your application, you can um, you can pick and choose where you want that to run. Um, if you have both available, or you can start with one on general purpose on, on the general purpose processor. And then after you have both developed, you have that freedom to to pick and choose and uh, which one specifically you want running, um, and and you can go about your development that way. Cool, that's nice. Can you go um, general purpose to FPGA, to general purpose to F FPGA, or do you have to have kind of a, a one way direction? You you can, <laughs> it, it is possible. So those general purpose high 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 performance Axie ports, we actually use all four of them. In some of our platforms, and when you have that the crossing between interconnects, um, you can obviously if you have you know just four, you'll use four. But once you exceed the four, you can actually ill round robin between that the data transfer will round robin between those four. Um, but yeah, the, it, it is possible. Okay, nice. I was wondering if there's a kind of like a minimum uh, project example somewhere. Um, like a minimum project example? Yeah, like something that the best place that I can have a look at to just try and get an idea of how how it all works essentially. Oh, okay. Um, so well, when we, you know, so there's three types, really three types of development. Um, there's the application development, component development, and then there's an OSP development and that stands for Open CPI System Support Project. A lot of people use the term BSP. <laughs> but uh, we decided to create our own. Uh, so the OSP development. Um, and so basically you, you create component, a component developer create components that an application developer will use. And then an OSP developer will en enable new FPGA platforms, um, you know, to be open CPI compatible. Um, and as far as every, uh, OSP development, there's always a chain of, um, of proving that the FPGA is functional to to its ability, and one of the first stages is is being able to uh, hardware acceleration, being able to send data to the FPGA and then receive data to FPGA in that application. What we call as test bias, um, and and that there's a FPGA worker that's in in the FPGA that basically just you know, you, you bias it to a certain value. So if you set, you set the bias to one, you know, when you, when you read back the data, they'll, if it was just all zeros, you get a one back type of thing. And that, that's kind of our like, hello world of open CPI to get that application running. Okay, nice. I did have, I, could sh I think I, I showed that in one of my, in one of the videos that was linked on Slack on, on what kind of like the first applications to run. Um, and there is a work alike. There's there's a software version of the bias worker, and there's an FPGA version of the bias worker. Okay, nice. Yeah, I need to invest some time to to play with it, but it sounds sounds very impressive. So, so um, can, um, last thing I was doing was trying to get the DMA. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I used first. Um, like Axie Light accesses. So basically each 
four byte word is one access or something like that, which is, you know, functionally it's nice, but it's like zero performance. Uh, so X, with DMA, you can obviously stream a bunch of data. And then yeah. the next thing would be the, like, I think the term is like scatter gather, like you can send a bunch of transfers, like chain stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, with OpenCPI, can, can you chain, for example, I want to send, uh, I don't know, 10, 10 frames of, you know, with a certain configuration. So basically I'm trying to get the, like back to back data in and see, like check. Yeah, so we don't use yeah. the scatter gather on the Axie. Um, we use, I think, the burst transactions. Um, but as far as streaming data, so so within Open CPI, we 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 take into account back pressure, and for the encoder, um, the back pressure will, will come from the transceiver, uh, and it's basically a message passing, uh, uh, sending messages of buffers uh, to and from the fabric, um, and then there's this back pressure that you'll get from the DAC because of the certain the sample rate that you set it to. Because obviously you, you can stream data faster than you, than you could send it out, uh, well, depending on, on the configuration you're running or depending on what uh, sample rate you're running. Um, and especially if you're doing it from the, ar the, the ARM itself, yeah, you can quickly get to a point where you can't send enough data to, to fulfill the DAC's need. But, <clears throat> but yeah, we, we do take account that back pressure and then the workers has a uh, handshaking that that essentially tells the processor it's like, hey, I can't handle this much data. Um, or it, it could say the opposite, you know, keep sending me data as fast as you can type of thing. Um, but but yeah, I hope that answers the question. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so you said it's not quite Axie. Uh, I, I went for Axie because I don't know it seemed the most obvious. Yeah. Uh, is it... Um, is the adaptation i mean it's well, maybe the question it's, is it's it's like this, it's like really close to axi yeah it's really close to axi where yeah the <laughs> adaptation won't, won't take and it, it's closer to an axi stream interface versus an axi for light interface um where we have this give and take between the workers um and and that's how that back pressure flows between all the different components including the the software on the software side as well Okay, uh, yeah, it's probably uh, like Axie with some extra port, like extra metadata or something. Yeah, yeah, yep. Okay, oh, yeah, it, fair enough. Yeah, because a way that two components uh, communicate with each other uh, is through uh, a port, uh, in, an input or an output, and you can have multiple ports per worker, but, but in that port, uh, there's a configuration or protocol that's defined of, of what type of data is being sent between those two workers. Um, the simplest example that we have of a protocol is an, an IQ stream protocol where it'll, you know, 16 bits for the, uh, the real and then 16 bits for the imaginary. And then that, that gets, that's handled by the framework itself and, and it will instantiate a 32-bit bus between those two workers as well as all the, the signals, uh, the, the handshaking that has to happen in order to move data across those, those two, two workers in the, fa in the fabric. Um, and then when you, when you cross a boundary to the general purpose processor that, through that interconnect, there's also certain handshaking that happens, doorbells for the DMA to happen to, to, to let the <laughs> other side know that it, you know, there's data produced and consumed type of thing. Uh, yeah, I, I'm looking forward to using that. To be honest, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll sort of try to. I was going for the uh, DMA stuff side, mm -hmm. but I'm probably going to uh, dedicate to um, some more time to uh, reading and learning how to use it. Okay, I was curious. This isn't really a, an immediate problem, but in the final implementation, we were going to have a this thing on orbit. Um, and we want to reconfigure the, the SDR um, yeah, through its lifetime. I was curious if OpenCPI, because you were talking about the reconfiguration options, how that might work on Orbit. So we, rec we configure the bitstream pretty much freely. Um, 
but as far as reconfiguration, you also will probably want to reconfigure the ARM processor as well, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, and that would probably store it on QSPY or something like that, or some sort of other storage. So that, that's kind of a little bit outside of the scope of OpenCPI. Um, okay. we, do, we do handle a lot of stuff just to get started in the sense where we pack, we use this like a pretty generic version of Peta Linux um, that pretty much pre-built by, by the vendor and or through uh, the Peta Linux scripts. Um, and typically the way we run it is, is in SD card mode. Um, but, you know, there's all, all these other ways that you can configure an FPGA, well, any, any FPGA for that matter. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's good actually, because it means that it's less likely to constrain us once we get to that problem. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, I mean, I think this sounds, sounds amazing. It can, could answer a lot of our problems we've had and allow us to be a lot more agile and nimble in the future. So I'm all for it. Yeah, I'm a yeah, so problem. <laughs> I, I'm an FPGA hoarder, so I have all these different types of FPGAs and, and you know, trying to stand up one like each individual, you know, the Vado instance is, is uh, yeah, this is one open CPI kind of like opens the door for a lot of people who have FBJs laying around in, in at, at their home, you know, when they buy just a simple, just, just get playing around with it quicker type of thing once it's enabled. Cool. And yeah, and if it helps us get the on-air tests and with possibly the, the ADM Pluto, that's also good. Yeah. And then there's the the receive side, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so the receive side's a bit up in the air at the moment. Um, we need to look at that. So I know Michelle's been working with M17 Group. I haven't been involved with that at all, um, but it looks interesting. But we also so had that by the, the original kind of architecture, the receive has some interesting properties. I think it's like 400 narrowband channels that then get combined. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of work on the receive side as well. Um, it yeah. still needs to be looked at. But that goes back to the kind of system modeling stuff that I mentioned. Um, it'd be really nice if we can, yeah, make some system models, even if it's C++ and not Python. Um, if you decide mm -hmm. to put the things together and get an idea of how it will work together. Do you think it, uh, we could use the um, like new radios? It's it's usually C, but I think it's only C. Um, so yeah, that's been brought up in the past. Yeah, how can we get a GNU radio block into OpenCPI? Um, mm -hmm. and it has been done, but there's not a straightforward, you know, you know, like a <laughs> a converter, uh, if you will, um, that's yeah. been generated. But but yeah. It's been, yeah, I, there's, well, there's not open examples of it, but. <laughs> yeah, I imagine that um, for someone who is very familiar with C and maybe GNU radio and, and open CPI, <laughs> it's very, it's doable. Like you, you, you just need, like quote unquote, just need to hook things up. Um, yeah. Actually, we, we do have some yeah. examples that are coming, coming out. Um, I don't know exa the exact timeline, but uh, you know, a lot of SDR frameworks have you know ADSB receiver as an example, or um, that's one that's coming out, and then another one would be a Zigbee receiver type of thing, just to to get familiar with with how components and workers are connected and stuff like that. So, so that's one of the things that we're trying to to have more examples because we have one like I mentioned the test bias one that's the pretty much a simple example and then the next example after that is is an, an FSK transmit and receive that just transmits an, an image um, and, and that utilizes the the, the transceiver um, and so that's the next example so I think having more reference app, reference applications available for people to digest is one of the things that we're trying to work on so that, that you know it'd be easier to to, to come up to speed. Yeah, well, maybe we can help you with that as we start to, to use it more, so. Yeah. yeah, I do have also interest in M17 as well. <laughs> this <laughs> might be applicable for that as well. Because I know uh, from the past videos that I've seen that M17 would be used as an uplink, but for phase four, that that uplink is gonna be a, a modification of M17, not, not M17 directly. 
Yeah, I believe taking out the FSK and using PSK. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I'm not totally up to date on that. But yeah. yeah. So uh, for the like the, the the payload, you know, suppose we want to launch the um, the thing. Like we're gonna obviously the the receiver, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, this is the receiver where, like, there's there's the receiver as in the the Earth part. Mm -hmm. There's the receiver in the space part. It, like the space part is the, is the thing that is it's harder because of the four hundred something channels that I think Thomas mentioned, right? Yeah. Like the Earth one is probably not simple, simple, but like you can use like off the shelf stuff, right? Okay. Well. I think the Earth one, they have to they have so the the space receive is a simpler protocol, um, so be using older, less good but easier um, technology. So basically, especially the the forward error correction. Whereas the Earth receive will have to basically undo the or decode the DVBX, DVBS two X, which will be a bit of work. Um, but there are off the shelf um, chips that can do that, which I think um, Wally looked at had a few candidates that could basically receive it. So yeah, they both have the the difficulties, but kind of in different areas. Okay, so for the on Earth receiver, we're going to leverage an ASIC to do the LDPC decoding. Yeah, that's the the kind of baseline plan. Um, last okay. I heard, yep. So we have in the remote labs, we have um, quite serious DVB-S 2X um, receivers, I think kind of professional grade ones for, for testing, um, and then lower cost ones for, for actual user terminals. Okay. So I think once we can get an image into an FPGA and out some kind of RF transceiver, then we can start yeah, hooking up to those, those um, test units in the in the lab and yeah test everything works cool yeah so one thing i have not tested um is the like the dummy frames like i disable because it, otherwise it would flood you know the my ups uh, yeah my ingress side and mm -hmm. so if we obviously if we have uh, like a, a proper receiver we can um we can check if that's actually correct. Yep, makes sense. Yeah. So would that would be transmitting? Well, I know the end goal is the GSC, which is just packet data through the DVBS too, but but interim interim, would it be just standard video packets or or, or yeah, I'm not sure. If that's worth it. Yeah, I mean so I think a technical level doesn't really matter as long as we know what it is but from a outreach perspective i think video has been raised as something quite attractive because it's obviously quite visceral to demonstrate to people that it works yeah i'm definitely excited about that i mean i've <laughs> i've been following this for more than four or five years i think <laughs> this <Okay>. is finally <laughs> just <laughs> <laughs> yeah. finally you know opened up yeah, that's good. <laughs> that's good to have you on board. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's a whole reason I got my 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 FCC, FCC license was to contribute for this project. So okay, I'm nice. definitely excited. Yeah, I don't actually have a, an amateur radio license myself. I need to need to get that sorted. Um, yeah, I don't either. Uh, I mean, it, it, it's probably stupid, but why why would I need one? Like, if I want an antenna and point at the skies kind of stuff. <laughs> I, I need a license. Is that the case? No, no, I think you only need a oh, license if you want to transmit on yeah, exactly. And then oh, okay. the applications of this is also, I think, been talked about terrestrial point to point type of things as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Um, I don't know if you have anything you want to chip in, Paul. No, I was just here to see if there was anything for the remote lab. All right, cool. So I, I did have a question. 
Um, so OpenCPI supports Vivado and Vitus 2019.2. Um, we are looking at supporting newer versions of that, but I noticed that you guys use 2020.2. 20, uh, Is there any particular reason for that? I think the reason was if one person started using it and then we all started <laughs> using it. I don't think it was, uh, yeah, for any good reason. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, it was the one I, I, well, I think, well, I picked up any version, really. I don't know about the labs, but we can, so 2019.2, you said, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I can, okay. Yeah. yeah well, we have plans of upgrading, and I did spend a little time uh, to see if the scripts that we have will generate the, the RCC platform would work. Um, so there's there's still more work. It, it is possible. It's not it's not something huge, but, but right off the bat, we... The, the version that we support is 2019.02. Okay, yeah, it's not a big deal to just install a different version. Yeah. So um, if you need any help with the, the encoder part, um, you just let me know. I can um, I can do whatever. Okay. I'll start trying to learn the, the, the open CPI uh, things. Um, yeah. But yeah. In a way, it's similar. Like I worked at the company, like they they basically did uh, like a high level. You basically wrote Java, and the whole thing converted to FPGA. Mm -hmm. And they did deal with Vivado under the hood and DMA and uh, kernel modules. So a lot of the stuff is kind of weirdly familiar. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I hope you did. Yeah. I hope you did better than they did. Like yeah. they had some serious issues, but uh, never mind. <laughs> 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 yeah, I hope so too. Yeah. So like, if, if there's any like particular topic that, that you want to know more about, I mean, I, I can generate, I, I know we've got pointed to some of the videos that exist, but I can also create videos that kind of help explain kind of the, the background of some of the things. Um, if that's helpful, that, that's a possibility as well. Because I'm sure cool. other new users will probably have the same questions. Um, and yeah, I, I need to come up with the questions first. Like, <laughs> okay. I know from what I read, it sounds really good. Like, you know, I'm, like if we had this working now, it would be you no. Know, would help a lot in testing. Mm -hmm. You know, and so I'm really, I, I really need to learn. So I, I'm convinced that it's good. <laughs> yeah, um, I just need to get my head around and yeah, the models and yeah, how to work with it. Okay. Yeah, I mean, the other nice thing is that at the moment we're using quite expensive development boards, which um, limits people reusing the work. But with this, um, yeah, it allows more people to, to actually use the work, which is excellent. So this Pluto SDR, is it uh, like you plug in? I think I, how much does it cost? Like you it said, was, it was cheap one. It's $150 from Mauser. And you connect to USB, I think, right? Yeah, it's it's USB two. So that that's if you're getting from a from a host development system, getting samples and or sending data through that is is kind of like the limiting factor of it. But if you're generating everything uh, from or mo majority of the things from the arm and and the fabric, then that's not really a problem. You can leverage the the capabilities yeah. of the transceiver itself. Uh, but yeah, it is USB. Yeah, I'm gonna look at it maybe. Like the first thing is obviously see if the um, encoder would fit. Like I can, it, it's not very demanding, but I didn't really write into a, a way that you could say, oh, yeah, I, I don't want uh, yeah, short that's... frames. I don't want this. So the logic is smaller kind of thing. It's all sort of tied into the general thing. Yeah, that's one of the, Oh, it's not really a drawback, but yeah, since it's such a cheap platform that it uses the Zinc 7010 and the, the FPGA resources are on the lighter side compared to, to the other platforms that you're, the, the ZC706 and the ZCU106. Um, but it would be pretty cool to, to see it see it on there. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Cool, cool. Okay, so I, I, I don't have any more questions, I think. No, neither do I. Um, just... Uh... Excited to see where it goes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, same, same. Okay, cool. Well, then I guess we'll wrap up. And um, thanks, everyone, for attending. It was a good chat. Yep. Yeah.
Thank you. Thank you very much. Cool. Speak later. Guys later. Bye. Bye bye.